Okay. I think we're good to go. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the first day of the 2024 Evergreen International Conference. My name is Taryn McKenna, and I'll be moderating a beginner's guide to evergreen permissions with your presenter, Susan Morrison from Georgia Pines. Before we get started, I'd like to make sure to thank our sponsors. Equinox has sponsored the uh, feed loop platform that we're using. Uh, ECDI, the Evergreen Community Development Ish Initiative, is sponsoring the captioning, and I'll post a link to that in just a moment. And Kipu is going to be sponsoring the Thursday Developer Hack Fest um, and in the same day that we'll have the interest groups. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat. You can use either the Zoom chat or the Feedloop chat, and I will be monitoring both of them. They are not synced together, so you can, if you want to pay attention to both, you can open both. This session will be recorded. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Susan. So I'm going to stop sharing. And Susan, is your button green yet? Your share button? Um, it is green, but it still says it's disabled. Oh, okay. um, let me see. Let's see. Let me see if I can give it to you. Okay. Try it now. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. And sorry, of course, I woke up this morning with a sore throat, so hopefully my voice won't give out in a couple of slides. Um, but thank you all so much for coming today. My name is Susan Morrison, and I'm the Pines Operations Analyst with the Georgia Public Library Service. And for about two years now, I've been working on a permissions review project for Pines to review our permission groups, uh, primarily focusing on staff groups. So when I started the review project, I knew very little about Evergreen and absolutely nothing about permissions. So I'm hoping today uh, to share some of the basics of what I've learned about permissions up to this point in hopes that it may help others who are in the same boat. Um, so this is a beginner's guide to evergreen permissions. During the presentation, I'll go over what permissions are and how they're checked, how depth and grantability work, and then some basics of managing permissions in the staff client, including how to manage permission groups and individual permissions. I have a slide at the end that includes links to various resources, and then I'm hoping to have some time at the end for questions, but of course, feel free to ask questions at any time throughout the presentation. Also, a disclaimer that I do introduce certain topics that I then have to kind of wait to expand on in later slides. Um, so I will, you know, let you know when I'll, you know, touch on something later on, and I also include links in the slides to cross-reference that information. I also have some step-by-step -step slides with screenshots for some of the various workflows, uh, but for time's sake and to not completely bore everyone, um, I'm not gonna be reading out each of those steps. I'll just be pointing out certain things to note during those workflows. And then you can always refer back to the slides if needed. Um, there'll be a permissions working group meeting during the Hackfest on Thursday from 12.30 to two. Um, so I'd be happy to show any of these, you know, anything that we go through today in real time during that meeting. So to start off, what are permissions? Permissions determine everything a user can do in Evergreen. So for patron groups, permissions allow them to do everything from logging into the OPAC, placing holds, making lists. Uh, for staff, for staff groups, it also determines everything they can do within the staff client. So starting with logging in. Um, each permission is named with a code and that staff login is an example. And then they are called within the various levels of code within Evergreen. For staff accounts, permissions are tied to a working location, and that is necessary for staff to be able to perform any function in the client. Otherwise, you may have seen, um, you know, you may be able to log into Evergreen, but you might see a white screen, um, and that's because it does have to be associated uh, with a context or a location. Permissions can be managed and assigned as a group or individually, and they can also be managed within the staff client 
or from the database side. Um, so today I'll only be covering that staff client side. And finally, permissions are complicated and they do involve a variety of exceptions. Um, some interfaces just need one permission to manage everything in there. Some have more granular permissions. Some permissions need to be grouped together to perform certain functions like checking out a book to a patron. So they're like a puzzle, hence the theme of my slides, um, because they fit together to form a greater picture of what staff can do. And if there is you know, a piece missing, it may affect the functionality. Um, so it may affect staff workflows. And it can be hard to assess sometimes what goes where. And a fun fact, um, as of 312, there are roughly 640 permissions in stock Evergreen. Some, um, I think a few of those are listed as deprecated, um, but your library or consortium may have local customized per permissions as well. So for example, Pines, we currently have about 740. So there are a lot. <laughs> So to see a list of all the available permissions and their descriptions, there's a permissions list interface within the server admin menu. There are, um, there's a column to show the code or the name of each permission, and then also a description of what that permission allows the user to do. So you may see that not every permission in here has a description, it just has the name of the permission repeated. And then sometimes the descriptions can be a little bit ambiguous. Um, so this is something that um, the permissions working group is working on and I'm working on in my project review as well. So there is a more updated list of the descriptions in the evergreen documentation that I provide a link for at the end. Um, but there's still some missing information um, and it will probably always be a work in progress. And for this presentation, I'm going to skip over how to create these individual permissions that does involve some kind of, you know, back end uh, configuration. And it's likely with a general end user, like, um, you know, just library staff or consortial staff um, that aren't, you know, developers or system admins, um, likely what you would deal with the least. Um, but I do want to note that uh, because this is a presentation about permissions, I've linked uh, slides that list the permissions needed to manage each of these interfaces. So if you do see a little uh, you know, puzzle piece at the bottom right hand corner, it will take you to a slide that lists the permissions you need for that interface. And I'll be saying permissions probably a thousand more times, so apologies for that repetition. Okay, so permission check. Uh, when a user performs an action, the system looks at whether the user is active. Does the user have the permission to perform that action? And then where can the user exercise that permission? And this is otherwise known as depth, which we'll talk about shortly. And when it's looking at where, it will look at the home library and the working location of that uh, user at the same time. So if the permission check succeeds, the action is allowed and they're able to perform that function. If the permission check fails, the action is not allowed and you'll receive a permission denied error message. And that's sometimes. So there are times where the action will fail silently or will give a more general fail message like update failed. So it can be hard at times to tell if the action is failing because of a permissions issue. Uh, so this is something we're both working on documenting when that happens. And also the user interface interest group is working on just the error message behavior in general um, to make everything more consistent um, and you know, provide more clarity when you run into something like that. And these are just a couple screenshots of the example error messages. I think these are the main two that you see that are the um, specific permission denied. So that's what that means. If And it's helpful that it does list the permission um, that you need in that instance. So depth and grantability are two attributes that can be assigned to each permission. 
and they can be determined at the group level. So in this case, if um, the depth and grantability would apply to that permission for anyone assigned to that group, and they can also be determined at an individual level in the user permission editor. Um, so they would just apply to that specific user. And I'll discuss the actual process of assigning these values um, later on in the presentation. So as I mentioned previously, depth answers the question, where can the user exercise this permission? So it's associated with working location and home library primarily. Um, and sometimes it does also, it all is dependent on the workstation. And in some instances, I found that it does check for all three. Um, and stock evergreen, there are four scopes. So each scope is indicated by a number from zero to three. And the lower the number, the broader the depth. So if the permission is assigned at the consortium level, the user can perform that action anywhere in the consortium. If it's assigned at the system level, they can perform that action anywhere in the system. So a good example of that is a cataloger would only be, at, um, be able to edit the items um, that their system owns um, and so on with branch and sublibrary or bookmobile. And there are some permissions that have to be assigned at the consortium level or at zero in order to work. Um, I have just listed some random examples here, um, but they would deal with attributes that apply to you know, your whole organization or consortium, like org unit setting types, global flags, and then permissions themselves. And while depth affects the actual uh, you know, performing of the function, grantability does not affect how or if the permission allows the staff member to perform that action. It affects the ability to assign that permission to another user. Um, so it answers the question, can the user with this permission assign the permission to another user? So it is a true or false value. And if the permission is marked as grantable, um, users can only grant that permission to another user at the same depth that they have it assigned or a more narrow depth. So if I have that permission to create a survey at the system level and it's grantable, I can assign that permission to another user at the system branch or sublibrary level. I would not be able to assign it at the consortium level. And I would only be able to assign it to users whose accounts that I have the permission to edit. So if I'm a CERC staff and I don't have the ability to edit a cataloger's account, I can't assign them that permission. So whether it's marked as grantable for me or not. Um, and then to assign uh, individual permissions or to assign uh, to grant permissions to user accounts, you would do that through the user permission editor. And I can just check chat later. Okay, so next, um, when you're first setting up Evergreen or doing any permissions review project, you'll very likely start by defining permissions. So we'll talk about, or sorry, defining permission groups. So we'll talk about those next. And um, so with the you know, very high number of permissions that are available, it would be very difficult to manage those all individually and have you know, a consistent experience for all users within that group or across the board. So permission groups provide a way to organize permissions so they can be assigned all at once to a user and then again, be consistent for each of those users. There are different approaches that libraries have used um, when determining their groups. Uh, some are based on roles, so it might be, um, you know, circulator, cataloger, administrator, um, and some take a more modular approach. So that's where permissions are uh, broken out into smaller groups or categories and focus on a more specific function or workflow. Um, and the most common example I've heard of that is the reports permissions. So those are, there's four permissions um, that deal with the main reports interface. Um, and there's also permission for the simple reporter. Um, and I've heard that those are often assigned just as um, you know, kind of a small group onto a user's account. So in addition to other 
modular groups. Um, every user, whether a patron, vendor, or staff, they must be assigned a main permission group um, because they all, you know, use the system in some way. Um, another example is, uh, you know, SIP accounts used for self-check machines. They would need certain permissions to be able, you know, to check in and out books. So they would require a specific set. And also users can have multiple permission groups, as mentioned, you know, with that kind of modular approach. And these are known as secondary groups. So the permissions group interface is also located in server administration. There are stock permission groups in Evergreen that you can start with. And those are listed here on the, the left-hand side. The groups listed next to the small arrows signify parent groups. So that are uh, generally not assigned to users. So it's kind of the umbrella that um, the other groups fall under. Each of the parent groups have a base set of permissions that are then inherited by each of the child groups. And then each of the child groups have additional permissions assigned to their group locally. So in this case, the patrons, so the users is that main parent group. The patrons and staff groups are child groups of users. So they would inherit all the permissions um, from the user group. And then the staff group is like a sub parent group. So it will have the user permissions plus its own staff permissions that then all of the staff child groups would inherit. And I'll expand on that in, in just a second. So when you click on the name of a permission group, there is a, there are two tabs, the group details and the group permissions. And within the group details, you have the option to edit these details, add a child permission group or delete the permission group. And um, to explain you know, each of the, the details here, the name, of course, is just the name of the permission group. The description is an optional field if you wanted to you know, include any other defining factors that help um, explain what the group is. The user expiration interval is the uh, you know, frequency of, at which the accounts expire. So everyone, um, you know, in this case, it would expire every three years. The application permission. So you may see these, um, there's a group of these group application permissions in Stock Evergreen. And these determine what permission is needed to assign users to this group and also edit users within, within this group. Um, so if you, and usually these, um, I think all of these uh, child groups here each have their own group application permission. So there's more uh, granularity on who can edit whose accounts. Um, so you would, you know, you'll see a, a group application permission for each of those that are specific. The hold priority is the priority given to that group in the holds queue. The default is zero. And then the lower the number, the higher the priority. And the user group is another Boolean attribute. So that indicates whether the permission group can be assigned to users. So in this case, the staff group is a parent group. Um, I don't want uh, users to be assigned, you know, kind of just that generic staff group. I want them to be assigned to something, you know, one of the more specific groups. Um, so I would put that as false. Um, and you'll see um, in screenshots later on that in the account, um, these that are marked as not being a user group, they are grayed out in the permissions drop down, so you won't be able to assign them. So this shows the process of editing permission group details. Um, and when you're looking or when you're editing or creating the permission group, you'll see in the record editor that the parent group name is listed. So that can be helpful just to make sure you're in the right group. Um, a drop down for the required permission is there. And just a note that it will show all the permissions in the drop down, not just the group application one. So you could, I guess, technically assign any permission to edit a group. But. And same here. So this is, it's the same form. And if ever you're adding a child group, you would just want to make sure you have selected the correct parent group. 
Um, so if you're creating, let's say a new vendor account or it's kind of its own, you know, sub parent group, you would go, you know, from the top of the tree. So go from the, the users um, and choose accordingly. And when deleting, the main thing to note here is that um, no users can be assigned to the group. Um, or if, if any users are assigned to the group, it won't allow you to delete it. So it's kind of similar to, um, you know, if a patron is assigned to a stat cat, you wouldn't be able to delete that stat cat. So all users would need to be reassigned to a different permission group before deleting. And then you would also want to make sure they don't have it assigned as a uh, secondary group. Okay, so here is what the group permissions tab looks like. And in this example, this is the list for the stock catalogers permission group. This is a good visual to further explain the difference between uh, permissions that are inherited and permissions that are assigned locally. So in the grid um, under the group column, the parent group names will always be linked. So you can see here the parent groups are staff and users. And those link out, if you click on the links, you would go to their group permissions tab. And that's because you can't edit inherited perms within the child group. Um, so you would have to edit it within the actual parent group where it's originally assigned. Um, so this is also indicated here. You can see you can't change those depth or grantability values and inherited is uh, in the delete column. Uh, so since we're in the catalogers permissions list, these any that are assigned locally can be edited or removed. And you can also add permissions um, with this new mapping button up here. There's also a filter at the top of the list. So that's helpful if you want to quickly see if a group has a certain permission assigned to them. And that filter does carry over. So if I started um, you know, if I search for a permission here and then I wanted to see, do the circulator, does a circulator group have this permission too? You could click um, that left hand tree of the permission groups would still show. I could click into another group and the filter would still apply. Okay, so adding permission groups, again, you'd use the add new mapping button you can type into the field to bring up a drop down. So it is helpful to know, you would wanna know the code or the name of the permission so you can start the search and it will filter um, you know, as you type. And here is another place you can determine the depth and grantability for that permission. And a main feature I wanted to note here is that as of 3.11, you can add multiple permissions at once. Um, so you can actually, I'll go back to this slide. Um, instead of before 311, you have to complete all six steps to add a permission. So it was just one at a time and it could be time consuming. Um, but now you can just do uh, complete steps two through five and kind of form that list of the permissions and then add them all at once. And the changes that can be applied uh, to the individual permissions are um, just the depth and grantability. So once you make any edits to those values, you can click on the apply changes button. And there's also, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a screenshot of that here, but there is also an apply changes button. Um, it's across the bottom of the permissions list. And removing a permission from a group is similar to the process of editing. You would just select the delete checkbox, which highlights the row, and then you would apply changes. Um, and one tip here is that you can apply really as many changes as you want to the permissions all at once before clicking apply changes. Um, so just to go back here, um, with these permissions, I can edit, I can change the depth, the grantability on any of them, I can select to delete one, and I can make all those selections before clicking apply changes, so they don't have to be edited just one at a time. Okay, so the permission tree display entry, um, if you add or delete permission groups, you'll want to update the permission tree display to reflect that. 
And the display shows up in two main places. One is the uh, main profile permission group. So that's just the drop down and their the accounts edit tab. Um, and that's what the interface that I'll show in a second um, will update. There's also the profile group drop down and the patron search that automatically updates. Um, so you don't, or you'll see that right away, um, but you would need to update it for uh, this drop down in the patron account. The interface is in local administration. And um, when you open the interface, the this library locator, it will default to your workstation location. Um, so you would not be able to see, I think you just see the display entries um, tag with nothing else. And um, so you'll want to make sure to change that to the consortium level so you can see all the groups. Um, so this is kind of an example of one of those. Um, and the permission to manage this too would have to be assigned at the consortium level since it applies to the whole consortium. There's not groups um, you know, that only apply to a system or, or branch. Um, so pretty self-explanatory, you can add the group. Um, you, know, you would just choose the parent group and click to add. Once the uh, pop-up comes up, you can choose from the available groups and it will only show you the groups that aren't already in the tree. Um, and with the add root entry, there are, um, I know there's at least one bug about its functionality. And honestly, when I was testing, I couldn't tell a difference whether I clicked that or not. Um, but the, uh, from documentation, it's to override the parent as um, like if you were adding or sorry, you would click the add root entry box to override the parent group if you're adding that to the tree and if you wanted it at the root level. Um, but again, if I clicked it or not, it didn't change of where it actually showed in the tree. You can also remove any permission group. So you'd wanna do that if you did delete some or weren't assigning any to users. And then you can also move the groups up and down. Um, so it will only allow you to move within a parent group. So it would let you move um, you know, the different staff subgroups, but you, it wouldn't let you move a staff subgroup out of that parent group. So you couldn't move it into the general user group. So that's the main thing to note there. Okay, so assigning groups to users, this is likely what most um, staff are the most familiar with. So there's two types of groups in a user's account. Uh, one, the main one is the permission group, or sorry, the main profile permission group, and that one is what's required. And this is the group that's also designated um, in the user summary of a patron or a user's account. And then this is what you would uh, use in the patron search. So, uh, but more than one account, or sorry, more than one group can be added to a user account. And this is done through secondary groups. Um, so a couple of things to note here. Um, so one example is uh, there may be staff, you know, maybe at a smaller library where one staff member does um, a lot of the circulation tasks and they also do cataloging. Um, so you could have a circulator group and a cataloger group assigned to one account so they can do both. Um, they are not included in the patron search, so you cannot search by secondary groups in that search. Um, but as of now, you can run a report to show a list of users and all their assigned groups. And the uh, report link right there, uh, that links to a slide at the end of the presentation that shows an example of that. So it just has the paths that you can use um, to report on those secondary groups. And another important thing to note that I will get into later is that if a user is assigned more than one group, it can cause some permission conflicts um, if, the, if both groups had the same permission assigned with different attributes. So I'll explain that more. So this is again, probably the process everyone has done many times, um, but it is uh, the same process for editing a patron's account. So you would just choose the group you want to assign to the user in the main profile permission group field and click save on the patron's account. 
For secondary groups, the secondary group button is on the same row as the main group. And once you open that, there is a pop-up. So you'll see a drop down for the groups and the action button to add. So you can add as many groups as you want before clicking apply changes. And when you do add secondary groups, you would need to save the account as you normally would with a patron edit. Then removing secondary groups, you'll see, uh, you'll click that same button and see the same pop up. The action uh, button will just be different. So you, it'll change to show delete for any of the groups that are currently assigned. Okay, so now onto the user permission editor for assigning individual permissions. Um, when you open the tab, and you can get to that through the administration menu drop down or through the patron account, um, the other tab. And when you open the tab, you'll see the assigned working locations at the top if you have the permission to see them. Um, so if you are able to assign working locations to a user, though just those options would show up here the permission list will show up beneath and it will show the entire list of permissions in Evergreen, not just the one that the user is currently assigned. So within the permissions list, you'll see that sometimes the, uh, you know, the three right-hand columns are grayed out, so those can't be edited. Um, that happens for two reasons. One is if you can see here that these permissions with the check mark are applied to the account already. So that means they inherited that permission from their assigned group. So it's already assigned to them and you can't edit or remove ind individual permissions um, from a user account. You can only add. Um, and then the, this group um, here that aren't applied, that means that that permission is not grantable to me. So I don't have the permission to grant this permission to this user. Um, so any that aren't grayed out, you can uh, you know, apply them, change the depth and change the grantability. And when you've made the changes, there's a little save button at um, all the way at the bottom of the list. So on the left hand side, um, you would click save and you do get a confirmation that it worked. If you don't have the permission to edit that account, um, it'll let you go through all the process. But when you click save, um, an ugly error message comes up. I think it just has a bunch of um, text on it. Okay, so now on to permission conflicts, and this is the last um, topic that I'll go over. Um, and I think it's important and hopefully we'll provide some further insight into um, reasons why staff may not be able to complete certain functions as expected, um, or if they're having you know, any issues doing their workflow, especially if they're assigned uh, multiple groups. So there's two ways you can have conflicts. You can inherit a permission from a parent group and also have that same permission assigned locally. Um, so these two screenshots are from that permission group interface in the permissions list tab. Um, so this symbol, and that there is a, you know, a little note here that says permissions marked with this symbol override the parent group permissions. And then within the list itself, you would see, um, you can see that there's you know, two permissions assigned or the same permission assigned. And the one that is over, will override it, will have that symbol next to it. So that's an, um, an easy indicator to know. The second way is that you can be assigned multiple permission groups and each which have the same permission assigned at different depths or grantability. And with that, there's not necessarily an indicator like there is in the group permissions tab when it relates to secondary groups. Um, you would just be able to see which rules are being followed in the user permission editor for that account. So when there is a conflict, the depth is checked first and it's checked at or looked at in ascending order. So from zero to three, and the broadest depth and its associated grantability wins. 
then grantability is checked second. So that's either a true or false value, so one or zero, and that value is looked at in descending order. So the true value of one would override the false value. Um, and I have a few examples to hopefully better explain that. So this is the case of, uh, or the example that was shown in the screenshots with the view org setting. Um, so let's say I'm a global administrator. So I have inherited that view org settings permission from the staff parent group. It's assigned at the system level and it's not set to be grantable. At the global administrator level, I have it assigned at zero depths so for the consortium and it is grantable. So because this global administrator permission is assigned at the consortium level, these are the rules that will be followed. So I would be able to view all org settings for the entire consortium. And I would also be able to grant that permission to other users, of course, with the if they don't already have it and if their account can be edited. Um, and this is, uh, so the cataloger and local administrator groups, um, it's, we've commonly heard that that uh, causes the most conflicts and that it can cause issues if um, in the same user account. Um, and I've heard that if the cataloger group is assigned as the main group and the local admin as the secondary, that it can help with this. Um, but so far in testing, I haven't been able to find a case where it matters whether, you know, which group is main or secondary. Um, if anyone has an example of this, I would love to know so I can document it um, because I'm sure, you know, there's just many ways of testing and many things to test to run into different um, situations. So I would love to, to know more if the, that does happen. Um, but in this case, so I have, uh, I have two groups assigned to my account, the cataloger group and the local administrator. They both have the create copy note permission and at the cataloger or in the cataloger group, it's assigned at the system level and it's not grantable at the local administrator level, it's assigned at the system level again, but it is grantable. So in this case, um, because the depths are the same, it'll follow that system level, but then because the grantability is true, that overrides the false value. So I would be able to create item notes on items that are owned by my system, and I would be able to grant that permission. Okay, and the last example is similar. It's with the secondary groups. Um, in this case, I have the delete copy permission at the uh, assigned to local administrator at the system level and it's grantable. With acquisitions, I have it assigned at the consortium level, but it's not grantable. So with the broader depth, this permission wins. I would be able to delete any items in the consortium and I would not be able to assign that permission to other users. Doing okay on time. Um, so this is the page of resource links. There are two main uh, pages in the current Evergreen documentation that uh, go over how to manage permissions. Um, I'm currently working with both the permissions working group and the documentation interest group uh, to reorganize some of that and also add some additional information. So currently there's not much um, in there about, you know, the conflicts or the depth and grantability. Um, so we are working on that. And then there's also that updated permissions list. So it does have uh, more descriptions and hopefully more specific descriptions than what's currently in uh, the database right now. Um, the permissions working group wiki is linked there and then just another plug for the meeting on Thursday from 1230 to 2. Um, and then also we'd love if you join the monthly meetings, uh, they're at, at the fourth Tuesday of each month at 3pm. 
Um, in the wiki, I do link the Evergreen Conference presentations or previous permissions presentations. Um, I'd highly recommend looking at those if you're interested or um, you know looking for more ideas of how you want to manage your groups. There's some specific projects that are talked about in those presentations. There is also linked in a permission testing sheet. So this is what I started uh, before the conference last year. And this is um, for the community to use and as much as you'd like. Um, I do have, there's a tab for all the permissions with their descriptions and testing notes. There's links for bugs, uh, documentation. Of course, it is by no means complete, um, but I've also been uh, recording what permission is needed for each workflow. So they're, you know, they're split up into cataloging cir circulation. And at each step of the way, I'm trying to figure out what permission is ex needed exactly for that step. Um, so hopefully there's something helpful in there for you. And please feel free to add comments, notes, um, questions to the document. Um, again, it is for the community. So I want people to be able to use it as much as they, they want to. Um, and the last two are code based. Um, so the field mapper is a map of the field. So it has, um, among other things, it defines permissions needed for various interfaces. So while it doesn't show every permission that's needed, um, it does have a lot of helpful information in there. So that's often where I go to try to, you know, if I'm trying to figure out uh, what permission is needed for what. Um, and there's also, you can search, you know, the code and Git. You can search by the permission name. So that can be helpful. Um, even if you know I don't understand most of what's in that code, but sometimes it can be helpful to see where it actually is in the code. Okay, and I do have, looks like we have eight minutes for questions. Um, and I had to put that hand coming out of the water icon. I don't know if that's <laughs> too dark, but um, yeah, hopefully <laughs> I provided some clarity today. <laughs> Everyone feel free to either put your questions in chat or you should be able to turn on your audio and ask, I believe, if you wish to do that too. Susan, can you see Michelle's question? Oh, sorry. Let's see. Okay. I think I saw, Michelle asked, I think I saw that the perm group display and patron search can be customized. Where is that configured? So that would be in the uh, permission tree display, um, and I can, and that's in local admin. And let me see if I can actually just, uh, I can try to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, so is that showing for everyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. I somehow have all these uh, windows open and I thought I closed mm -hmm. everything. Um, okay, so in the local administration, there is the, no, I'm not seeing, there it is, permission tree display entries. Um, so you would change, you know, this to the consortium level and then that's when you would see all the display entries. And then in here is where you could um, move up and down the entries. So I believe um, anytime I add a group here, it does automatically show up in the patron search, but you can at least, you know, move this up or down. And let's see if it works as the demo. <laughs> All right, so I just move acquisitions to the top. And then in the patron search, Okay, it didn't work. I might need to clear cache and log out and do all of that good stuff. I think there may be a bug as well with that. I think um, if you go to create a new patron, I believe it shows up, but it may not show up everywhere. Gotcha. Um, and Michelle asked, should that apply to patron search as well as patron registration edit? Yes, it should. It should. <laughs> yeah, it should. Whether it actually okay, yeah. does so or not. This, <laughs> yeah, this does um, in the patron edit, it does determine that. And that's why I think because the patron search does automatically update when I add a group or delete a group, 
I'm wonder, I think the permission tree display may just be for this drop down, not the patron search. So maybe that's what the bug is. But it did make that change here. Does anyone else have any questions while we still have Susan here? Yes, I, I've, I've seen that too, Michelle. I'm pretty sure there's a bug somewhere. I'm looking for it right now, but I'm not seeing it. Is there anything that I completely confuse people on? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'd I just like saw to... Andrea's comment. <laughs> yeah, that's not a fun fact. It's too much. <laughs> I'd like to repeat Susan's uh, encouragement for people to show up to the permission working group. Um, you don't have to be an expert on permissions to join that. You can come in and ask questions and experiment. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, all perspectives are so welcome. Um, so whatever you do in the library in your consortium, um, it would be great to have um, you know more people in those groups just to get again more perspectives. Um, there was one meeting where um, people shared you know how they thought about organizing groups or how they approached that. Um, so that to me can always be a continuing discussion because um, again, all the ideas that can help with that, um, I think could help everyone. Um, I'm curious, what steps do you take when doing an upgrade and checking for new permissions? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, we usually start by um, by reading through the release notes for whichever versions have uh, been released since the last time we upgraded. And the release notes should indicate any new permissions that have been added. And so then we'll discuss on the team, um, you know, which permission groups should have those permissions added. And hopefully so. Um, I have been trying to, or I have um, added the permissions as new ones have come out. So those are on the main testing sheet. Um, so hopefully, yeah, that's usually up to date, um, you know, once the release notes come out. Um, and as Chris said, we do test those thoroughly. Um, Chris also said, we review the SQL upgrade scripts for any perm additions and changes. Okay, we have one more minute. If anybody has one last question. Oh, and I'll put up my, I meant to put up my thank you slide. <laughs> And thank you, everyone. We have a 10 minute break and then we will get started with the next session. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all.